nice to come out to a place like this where you can hear the crickets calling in the evening, the sound of the doves in the late afternoon. There's something in the body and the mind that respond to being out in nature like this. Gives the mind a chance to settle down, put aside a lot of its cares. And for those of us who've been living in the city a lot, cut off from nature, there's often that thought, if only you can get back to nature and stay there, that would solve all your problems. But go ask people who live in nature all the time. And they can tell you the long list of problems that they still have living out in nature. And you think about human history as a whole, the times when people get really r romantic about nature are the times when they don't have to live in it. The idea of romanticizing wilderness didn't come in force in America until the frontier had been closed, nature had been tamed, to some extent, to the extent that human beings can tame nature. And it's important to keep this in mind as we practice. Coming out here does not solve all your problems. What it does is it gives you a place to practice so you can look deeper into where the real problems are. Because when the Buddha is talking about how conditions cause suffering, he wasn't talking about your social conditioning. He was talking about conditions of nature. That chant we had just now, the world is swept away. It's not just the human social world or your psychological world, it's the world as a whole. And everything in nature is marked with impermanence, stress, things that lie outside of your control. This applies not only to human beings, but also to animals of every kind. I sometimes hear people romanticizing the mental life of animals, that they don't have any sense of self and so they don't suffer. Well, that's not the case. Animals suffer often more than we do. They live in constant fear and no real understanding of what's going on around them. All they know is that they're hungry all the time. Yet in the need to go out and search for food, they're placing themselves in danger. And you read the writings of the forest monks, and they certainly don't romanticize nature. Even to John Lee, when he talks about the advantages of living in the forest and the lessons you learn, they're not lessons about how nice it is to get back and be one with nature. It's more of nature as a dangerous place where you have to be heedful all the time. Because it's not the case that we suffer only because of our social conditioning. We suffer because we live in a world of intereating. Beings are feeding on each other all the time. And we have this inner desire, this inner need to survive. We need to feed as well, to create, to keep these worlds, what they call bhava, our emotional worlds, our mental worlds, and just the physical world we live in to keep our experience of this world going, to survive, requires that we feed on one another emotionally, mentally, physically. And there's suffering not only in being eaten, but also in having to feed. So the conditions the Buddha is talking about are not just social conditions. It's not the fact that we're neurotic about our cravings. Craving in itself is a cause of suffering. And it's also the cause of continued being. This is how nature keeps going. Animals crave. This is how they keep going. This is how they survive. This is how they die. This is how they get reborn. So the ways of nature are not an ideal to which we're trying to return. They exemplify the problem, which as long as you have to feed, there's going to be suffering as long as your happiness depends on conditions of any kind.
there's going to be suffering and stress. The advantage of coming to a place like this is you get to look deep inside the mind to see where the, the wellsprings of these cravings come from, this process of fabrication that lies deep within the mind. And so as we meditate, we're trying to study fabrication as we experience it. This is the, this is the conditioning process in the mind and in the body. The basic fabrication in terms of the body is the breath. And as for the mind, there are two types. There's verbal fabrication and there's mental fabrication. Verbal fabrication is directed thought and evaluation. This is how you put sentences together in the mind. You focus on a topic and then you make comments about it. That conditions the mind. And then there's purely mental fabrication, which is feeling and perception. Perception here meaning the labels you apply to things. And normally the way we put these things together causes stress and suffering. If you do this with ignorance, you suffer. If you can learn how to do it with knowledge, you can turn this process of fabrication into the path. It doesn't mean that when you're on the path you don't suffer. It's, it's a different type of suffering. It's a suffering that leads to the end of suffering, or the karma that leads to the end of karma. There's still going to be a subtle level of suffering in the breath, even when you're concentrated on it and it's very subtle and very pleasant, even rapturous. There's still an element of stress there. But for the time being, you're, you're going to use that as a path. In fact, you put all three types of fabrication together to get the mind into concentration. You think about the breath, that's directed thought, and you evaluate the breath. And you find which ways of perceiving the breath help in the process of making it more comfortable. So you've got the perception and the feeling there as well. So you're taking the process of fabrication and you're turning it into a path to the end of fabrication. And you begin to see how much your intentions really do shape these things. The Buddha's picture of your experience is not that you're simply a passive observer of things, commenting on them. In other words, it's not like watching a TV show. The TV show is a given and you just either like it or dislike it, or you're neutral about it. That's not the Buddhist picture at all. He says, you're actively engaged in shaping your experience all the time. In fact, the extent to which your intentions are shaping your experience go a lot deeper and a lot more radical than you might imagine. This is one of the insights of awakening. How much your present intentions are needed for you to experience even the present moment. Because as the Buddha points out, that all of the aggregates, form, feeling, perception, fabrication, and consciousness, have an element of intention in them. There are lots of different potentials at any one moment, coming from your past karma, that you can focus on. And it's your choice which you focus on is going to determine what you experience. So there are potentials for different kinds of feelings. You look at the body and there are places in the body that if you focused on them, you can get yourself really in anguish or pain. You could take the, the germs of a pain and build it into something really overwhelming. There are other spots in the body where there's a potential for pleasure. You learn how to focus on those spots and you can develop strong sense of rapture well-being permeate the body, as they say, fills the body the way cool water in a spring coming at the bottom of the lake can fill the whole lake with its coolness. So you have the choice. What are you going to focus on now? Which sensations in the body help create a sense of well-being and which ones could create a sense of disease? What are you going to think about? What are you going to focus on? Those are choices you make all the time. and that. Those take these potentials that you have and turn them into an actual experience. So this is the advantage of coming out into a 
relatively natural place like this. It's not totally natural. If we turned off the water, the avocado trees would die, and the chaparral would come back, and there wouldn't be any shade during the day. So even here in the orchard, it's not totally natural. But at least there's enough peace and quiet where you can look into the mind and see that the source of trouble is not your social conditioning so much as it's just plain old fact of conditioning, fabrication, this process of becoming which is fed by craving. And you hear those crickets cricketing out there. And they're, they're not doing it in total pleasure and joy. They're hungry. You watch the animals around in the orchard. They're hungry. And they have to be wary. And this, as a meditator, you have to be wary as well. Because even when you create good stages of concentration, that's still a form of becoming. It still depends on causes and conditions. But at least it puts the mind in a position where it can observe that process and dig deeper. To watch the condition and to see how it happens. And ultimately to dig down to a an area where there is no more conditioning anymore, which is something that stands outside of nature as we know it. Because it's not the case that the condition comes from the unconditioned. The way the Buddha explained causality was that causes and effects influence each other. An effect turns around and has an influence on its cause. So there is no prime mover or first cause. or ground of being in the Buddhist teachings at all. And if anybody had been qualified to talk about Buddha nature, the Buddha would have been the one, but he never talked about Buddha nature at all. It's more that their causes and conditions affect each other. So if there's going to be something unconditioned, it has to be outside of the causal process entirely. It's something that's already there, but as long as you're dealing with fabrication, you're not going to see it. The only way you can see it is if you turn the fabrication in the direction of the path. So that the way you breathe and the way you think and the way you feel and perceive things is conditioned not by ignorance but by knowledge, by awareness, particularly awareness of what things cause stress and which things don't. And that kind of awareness you develop gradually. It's a skill that you work on as you get more and more sensitive both to the process of fabrication and to the stress that it causes, even on very subtle levels. And finally, you bring the mind to the point where you realize that no matter which direction you fabricate, which direction you intend, there's going to be stress. And if you manage it, you can drop all intention at that point. And that's when the mind opens up to this other dimension, which is totally separate. So it's not that we're returning to some place that we've come from. After all, as the Buddha points out, even little babies have their greed, anger, and delusion. It's just that their their faculties and their bodies aren't strong enough to act on it that much. And they but they suffer. You can see that very clearly. As soon as a child comes out of the womb, it cries. And a lot of child, the child's early life is spent in crying. Because it has these desires and yet it can't fulfill them. So it's not like we're trying to return to that state or returning to the state of nature like an animal. We're trying to find something that goes beyond nature as we know it. Because after all, if we were simply returning to a state where we were before, what's to prevent us from coming back out of that state again? If we could forget our true, wonderful nature once, what's to prevent us from forgetting it again? So instead we turn around and look at this process of fabrication that's going on all the time. Learn how to understand it, learn how to take it apart, use it as a path, and then learn once it's taken you as far as you can, it can take you, then you let it go. 
and that, as the Buddha said, takes us to something, we, to see something we've never seen before, to attain the as yet unattained, to realize the as yet unrealized. In other words, we're heading, heading into totally new territory. So keep that in mind as you practice. You can create wonderful luminous states in the mind. But again, remember, these two are fabricated. No matter what comes up in the practice, always look for learning how to familiarize yourself with it, and then learning to look for where is there still a level of stress in here. Because it's that perception of stress that's your way out. <laughs>